Hi everyone, Stepan here. Today I'm going to show you Karo Khan games played by Domarajo Gukesh uh, or Gukesh. He isn't known for the Karo Khan, he usually plays the Sicilian, but he plays the Karo Khan sometimes and he's one of the best young players or arguably the best. I don't know who's better, him, Nodirbek or Alireza, they're all great and I'm trying to learn the Karo Khan from them. I did a video with Alireza's Karo Khan games, you can see that uh, in the description. Today we're gonna have a look at five games played in the Karo Khan by Gukesh and he has some amazing ideas. He's not shying away from complications and I've also chosen games uh, played against players who aren't top GMs. As you can see on the screen we're starting with a game against a player rated well, he, his rating is just as low as mine, you could say about 2,000 FIDE. So we're going to see what Gukesh does against weaker players, and then we're going to see, uh, finally, we're going to see a game against Eric Hansen. Okay, so his opponent in this game is Gordon Fowler. He's about 2,000 FIDE, he's over 60, and this was played in the Rapid Team Championship uh, this year in August. So Fowler, star Fowler starts e4, we have c6, of course, every game is going to be the Karo Khan. d4, d5, e5, bishop f5, the advanced variation. And Fowler chooses to go c4. Now c4 is a very committal move, which allows black to undermine this center many, many, many times. And as we're going to see, black is going to have ideas like b6 and a5 and the whole queen side could disappear if black chooses to do so. Now, I'm familiar with this variation, and the reason I found this game interesting is because Gukesh found a way not to go into the equality that comes if, if black liquidates everything. Okay, e6 is, is normal. Knight c3, main move, knight e7, black is just developing, a3. Okay, now, what white is going to try to do, white is going to try to go c5 and b4, and gain space on the queen side. And it's absolutely essential that black breaks that control. If black does nothing, then black just has less space. Black already has less space in the center. If black allows white to have more space on the queen side too, black is just going to be worse. Okay, so knight d7, uh, c5, b6, undermining immediately. This is still the main idea. Now you, you have to do this. You're threatening to win a pawn and white has to play b4 to defend. Now you can pause the video here if you're unfamiliar with positions like these uh, but and, and try to have a look but I'll show you what happens. So after b4 we don't take on c5 that would be a mistake because b takes and it's, it's just symmetrical but black has this bad c6 pawn. Uh, instead we go a5 and now you can see the point. At this point we're threatening to win a pawn. Uh, if white did nothing we would just take on b4 because the a pawn is pinned, the rook still isn't defended. Therefore white plays bishop e3. And here is where Gukesh plays something that I really like. Now he is 2750 at this point, his opponent is 2000, so he needs to do something. The normal variation goes a, b, a, b, b, c, b, c, rook a1, queen a1, and then we start undermining the center from the other side with f6. Now I'm not saying he wouldn't have won this game, he probably would have won it, uh, because he is a genius and his opponent is an amateur, but still, this would have been harder to win. Instead he plays bishop g6, which is a very sneaky move. It doesn't do anything. It's not the engine's best choice, but it's a nice idea. You're freeing up the f5 square for the knight, therefore you're able to put more pressure on d4 and e3. If any of these pawns are taken, uh, you're safe enough. Whatever happens you can just take back. And <clears throat> if, for example, the b6 pawn is taken, all of a sudden you get these two squares potentially for your knight. So this is a waiting move that frees up the f5 square, and it's a really nice idea. Now his opponent makes a mistake immediately. What his opponent should have done was he should have taken the g5 square. So the correct idea here, if you ever find yourself in this position and need to punish bishop g6, is h4. Okay, so if h5, the bishop, best case for black, will, will go back, but then g4. 
and in this position white is actually threatening to win the bishop so we need to do something this is very similar to the tile variation so black probably would have to go h5 if black goes h6 then we can see the typical tile variation uh, stuff if black does continue with h6 where the queen ends up on d3 and uh, sorry for the moment that's not possible just a second whoa 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 because the rook is still undefended so we would still have a b but eventually that would be a possibility white couldn't go bishop d3 straight away but white could take on a5 for example and then go bishop d3 and white would have a queen on d3 putting pressure on all of the light squares which means that f6 is much harder to play this is this is the point of this advance now f6 is basically impossible because your knight is tied down to the defense of g6 that's that's what white should have done okay uh so in this position after h4 black would have been forced to play h5 therefore the knight gets the g5 square which is the dream square in the tile variation instead of that after bishop g6 his opponent played f4 now f4 isn't threatening anything f4 doesn't threaten to win the bishop because the f5 square is defended a million times so gukesh just continues knight f5 okay his opponent plays bishop f2 which is normal and now this he missed this and it's a really nice idea and this is actually the reason i chose this game this to me is incredible and any Karo Khan player should be familiar with this pattern so this here is a common pawn structure you get this a lot in the advanced Karo Khan you get the knight on f5 a lot in the Karo Khan now the d4 pawn is defended twice but we can take it uh, Gukesh didn't take it he played h5 which is a mistake instead look at this we take on d4 now what can white take with white can take with queen or bishop taking with the bishop is slightly better than taking with the queen but black is still very very close to winning so bishop takes and now we just liquidate everything a b4 a b4 b c5 b c5 bishop c5 and we end up having two pawns for a piece white's king side is completely undeveloped we have pressure along this diagonal and if the bishop is ever taken our knight gets d3 e4 b3 and so on and once these two pawns start moving forward white isn't going to have any squares for their pieces we're covering b1 the entire diagonal in fact is is covered by white unless white wants uh, by black unless white wants to trade off the light squared bishops which in this case wouldn't be a good idea because black can just castle go queen b6 rook b8 and start rolling the pawns alternatively after knight d4 if queen d4 then we do the same thing a b uh now a b is not possible because we lose the rook so queen b b c5 uh i don't know queen b2 was my analysis but maybe there's something better uh, we just go rook b8 and after the queen moves we just go c4 and the pawns are rolling forward this is overwhelming the engine gives like minus two for black this is a really nice pattern instead of that a gukish played h5 which is still a good attacking attempt uh, and white continues knight f3 which is fine and now we see a very thematic pattern in the karo khan another very thematic pattern in the karo khan he just gains space on the king side so h4 now remember this is move 12 and we already have such a complex position that Gukesh's opponent probably didn't really know what was going on. This is really hard to navigate. There's tension all over the board. Uh, there are imbalances over, all over the board. This is the complete opposite of a balanced position, which is why Gukesh is a good player. Okay, bishop e2. Now finally bc5 and bc5. Uh, I was slightly surprised that he didn't take on b4 first, but he wanted to get the b file and he didn't want to trade rooks, so that's understandable. Bishop e7, and there is this nice harmony in the black position, everything is working well together, uh, and there are no weaknesses. And you're going to see what happens next. Now, if I had black in this position, I wouldn't know what to do. I spent a lot of time analyzing this and trying to figure out what I would have done. 
Castling doesn't seem that great. Rook b8, maybe there's queen a4, double attacking two pawns. Uh, I, I wouldn't know what to do. He played bishop h5. A very counterintuitive move for me. But look at look at his plan. So bishop h5 is a move that prepares a maneuver that if, if you manage to achieve that maneuver, you, you have the whole position under control. The idea is white wants to take the knight. If white doesn't take the knight, then we just go g6. So white takes the knight. And after the knight is taken, we take with the e pawn. Usually in the advanced Karakhan, if you have to take ef5 or ed5, you're much worse. Unless you can do this. And once you plant this knight on e6, your knight controls the entire center and puts pressure on all of the weaknesses. So queen d3, g6 defends the pawn. Knight d2, knight f8. The knight is coming to e6. And after rook b1, knight e6, you can see that this was a huge improvement for black's position. He was in a position where he his pieces looked nice, but he couldn't really do anything. Now this bishop is wide open. This bishop is fine. This knight is amazing. What are these knights doing? What's this bishop on f2 doing? Okay, bishop e3. Uh, just d d defends the pawn. I don't know what else to say. Castles. Okay, knight a4, looking at the b6 square. But now the undermining starts again. This is why this game is so interesting. He he switches play from the king side to the center to the queen side and, and, and back many times. So now the time has come to, to create further weaknesses. So he plays f6. Okay, uh, white castles, which is fine. Fe5. Okay, Fe5. Uh, D5 looks kind of risky because it gives black a passed pawn. Still, ideas like knight b3, knight d4 could have attempted to equalize. If you can trade this knight off, then black becomes weak. I wouldn't be sure what to do in this position, whether to take f or 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 d. The problem with taking with the d pawn is that d4 is. Uh, immediately available and you lose the pawn with tempo on the queen so if d4 bishop f2 you take so so not pretty but and and of course queen d4 isn't possible because of knight e2 so it doesn't work tactically but f5 just seems ugly this knight is going to stay here and the pawns are moving forward now there's no preventing f4 and and g5 and so on okay immediately gukesh plays f4 and from my perspective this is already over uh, there's too much pressure on the white king side bishop f2 is forced rook a7 <coughs> switching the rook across preventing rook b7 playing against knight b6 making sure it isn't with tempo so rook b6 queen e8 defends the pawn but more importantly prepares a queen switch to the king side Excellent understanding of the position by Gukesh, of course. Rook fb1, and now f3. This is the killer move, opening the position up. There's no more hope. Uh, if you don't take, I'm gonna take. If you do take, then my pieces are coming in. This is actually an excellent clearance sacrifice, which prepares to give this monster knight an even better square. The knight wants to go into f4. We have to get rid of the pawn. It's not even a pawn sacrifice, it's just... You just push the pawn and, and, and win the position because you get the f4 square. So this was taken, knight f4. Tempo on the queen, queen b3. He would like to trade off queens, but we're not going to allow that, so queen d7. Uh, queen d1 comes back to the defense. And now you can go knight h3 straight away. Uh, he played bishop g5, ev everything is winning. Uh, you are playing with knight, two bishops, rook and queen against king and bishop, basically. And that's just too much. Not to mention that this rook would come in if if needed. He played rook 1 to b3, which doesn't really do anything. Uh, knight h3 check, king g2, and now finally the game ends. Bishop takes knight, queen takes knight, and bishop f3. This bishop cannot be taken because of queen g4. Uh, he took it anyway, rook f3, queen g4, uh, the, the rook comes to g3, h takes g3, bishop takes g3, and the final move of the game was rook a f7. 
uh, threatening to, to play rook f2 and win immediately. He could have played rook f2 straight away, but this is just stronger. So I was really impressed with this game, especially with this bishop g6 idea. And then finally, I was really impressed with the possibility of knight takes d4, which he didn't end up playing, but it was it was a really strong move. Okay, so this is how you fight against weaker players in this structure. You don't liquidate everything, you can wait. Now again, the only problem you could be facing is, is h4 in this position, uh, where you have to go h5 and give white the g5 square. But that's not the end of the world. White is slightly better. Okay, <clears throat> the next game was played in Trieste 2018. This wasn't a rapid game, this was a classical game. Uh, so at this point Gukesh was 2450, so he wasn't an extremely strong player yet. However, his opponent Marco Massironi uh, was rated 2200, so a significant difference in, in ratings. Okay, e4, c6, d4, d5, knight c3, we get the classical and we get the Tartakauer, there are other names, but okay. Knight takes f6, ef, e takes f6. Okay, now for a couple of moves we get the main line. c3, bishop d6, bishop d3, castles, queen c2, this is all very standard stuff. I've played this before, rook e8, knight e2, and h5. And <clears throat> the main line here goes castles for white, h4, and h3, where black has huge kingside pressure after, for example, knight d7, bishop e3, and knight f8. Uh, this is extremely enjoyable to play for black, in my opinion. The bishop could go to d7 or e6. You get the queen behind the bishop. Tremendous pressure. These pawns could move forward, after which the knight could come to g6 if this diagonal is occupied. Very, very pleasant for black, in my opinion. However, after knight d7, uh, sorry, uh, after h5, white didn't castle, white played bishop e3. And this is slightly more complicated to navigate for black. <clears throat> this means that the white king is going queenside, most cases. So why do you have a pawn on h5? I'm always worried to go into the Tartak hour pre precisely because of this. If white castles queenside, I've just weakened my king side, and I don't know what to do. Let's see what Gukesh did. Uh, he played knight d7, which is of course fine. White castles and knight f8 defends the h7 square. Uh, and in this position, uh, white played h3. Now h3 isn't really necessary. I think it's better for white to go king b1 or to simply gain some space in the center with c4, but h3 is fine. Okay, now what I do here, and I've had this position before, I play bishop e6, and I try to play for b5, queen a5, and, and so on, some pressure down the queen side. You're starting to attack, you're, you're gonna use these two bishops. And the idea Gukesh played was new to me. It has been played a couple of times. Uh, it's risky, to say the least. Let's, let's see what he did. He plays h4. Uh, and in the Karo Khan, you have an edge in the endgame. And having a pawn on h4 is a huge en edge in the endgame, because you're basically, well, you're controlling two pawns with one pawn, especially if the f-pawn was to move forward, uh, you, you would just get the g3 square. Now, why is it risky? Because your king is on g8, and after g3, and let's say rook g1, g3, you're opening up the g-file, and everything seems to be working together. What happens on rook dg1? Let's say rook dg1, bishop e6, king b1, I don't know, queen a5, my standard plan? Why, why, why isn't this happening? Okay, white still has to defend for a move, let's say b3. White continues the attack, but now g3. And this seems very scary to me. The g-file is going to open up. That's why I don't like this idea of the hook. Okay, so h4 creates a hook and g3 is happening, the g-file is opening up, there's no way to prevent that. So if you have a king stuck on g8, to me, this seems, 
uh, I wouldn't go there. Well, before I saw this game, so I'm going to show you what happened. Rook h1 played by white. Uh, in my opinion, not a precise move. Uh, it doesn't do anything for the kingside attack, doesn't do much for the defense, and signifies a rook trade down the e file, which brings us closer to an endgame, which is of course better for black because of the pawn on h4. So, to my mind, not a logical move. And now we're going to see the setup uh, Gukesh played for. This, this is the fun part for me. He plays g6, which is a move I would never consider. Okay, white continues c4, and now he plays bishop d7, developing a piece, knight c3, fine, and now f5. And to me, again, this seems extremely provocative, uh, but you're going to see the idea. Uh, white plays c5, which is arguably a bad move, because it gives away some squares. Uh, bishop e7, of course, defending uh, the king, bishop c4, okay. Very strong diagonal, if the f-pawn moves, if the knight moves, g6 could be weak, everything seems pinned and and under pressure, but knight e6. Now, this was allowed by white, of course, playing c5, but still, this knight is a great defender. Very similar to the advanced Karakhan game, if you remember, this knight was on e6 and controlling the entire board. Now, in this position, Black really should break the position, white really should break the position open. Uh, so d5 is the correct move. And I was surprised that Gukesh's 2200 rated opponent did play d5. This is the best move. Uh, of course, it gives away a pawn temporarily, or, well, or it gives away a pawn, but white gets tremendous pressure. So, of course, Gukesh has to take on c5. And now, uh, in this position, d6 was played, which is not a good move. d6 allows b6, of course, the bishop is pinned, and white is now playing for this pin down the d-file. Black is a pawn up, uh, and there isn't enough compensation for white. Instead of that, after knight c5, the correct move, surprisingly, is b4. And now, if you move the knight away, where do you move the knight? You cannot go to a4, you cannot really go to a6, uh, because if you go to a6, I can just take, and then you lose your bishop. So there aren't too many options. Uh, so after b4, cd5 has to be played. Okay, Black now has the extra pawn. He took the pawn. Uh, rook takes d5, and the knight now has to move away somewhere, but the knight has the e6 square. And now let's say we double up the rooks, okay? It works tactically for black, simply because black has queen c8, putting pressure on the bishop. That's why black isn't losing the d7 bishop, but it's still very scary. Let's say rook d7, queen c4, and knight d5. Looks, looks tremendous. We have to trade queens, king c2, we have to save the bishop. This pressure has to be more than enough for a pawn, especially because black's f-pawns are doubled, and especially because all of these pawns are on light squares, therefore, if this bishop disappears, black is in huge trouble. Okay, so after knight c5, b4 should have been played. Maybe it's hard to play b4 because it seems too weakening, but you have to appreciate the fact that this bishop is pinned, and that dc wins a bishop, therefore knight a6 isn't possible. Okay, instead he took dc6, bc6 and queen d2. Nah, no, now black is better. Bishop e6, black is just a pawn up. Uh, and you offer a queen trade because the bishop on c4 is loose. We have to trade queens, so queen d8, rook a d8, rook d8, rook d8, bishop c5. And here he threw in bishop g5 check, of course. Bishop takes e3 and bishop takes bishop. And this on... On, on his level, on Gukesh's level, is just a simple win. You have knight versus bishop uh, with an extra pawn. This pawn is blockaded. Uh, whatever white does, black just has a superior endgame. The game actually ended in six moves. Uh, g3 was played, which is unnecessary, and it makes the position even worse. But, okay, uh, h takes g3, f takes g3, king g7, improving the king, h4. Now h4 is actually a blunder because f4 now picks up all of the pawns, so king f6, 
b3, bishop a6, king c2 was played, rook d4, threatening f4. If f4 happens, that's it. Black has a passed pawn and the position is wide open. Uh, knight d1 was played, <coughs> and after f4, white resigned. Why? Well, if you move your rook, I take a pawn, and then take the other pawn. If you take the pawn, I take here, and your other pawn is under pressure too. Really no no salvation. Uh, but I thought this was interesting, playing h4, locking down these two pawns, and then going for this setup, g6, f5, knight e6. This is a new setup for me, which is I, why I was excited to, to see it. Okay, next game. Uh, this game was played in the Norway Chess Open uh, in 2021. Uh, Matthias Uneland is Gukesh's opponent. He's about 2200 fide. So again, not really the strongest of opponents. Gukesh was 2600 at this point. So e4, c6, knight c3, d5, knight f3, we get the two knights. And Gukic doesn't play bishop g4, which is what I always play. Instead, he, he takes on e4, knight takes e4 and knight f6. This is fine. Uh, this is the other way to play against the two knights. Queen e2, fine, knight e4, queen e4 and knight d7. This is a very tame variation, which... The reason I don't play this is because I don't think you have enough... Uh, to compensate for your bad bishop. You're gonna have to play knight f6, e6, and then you're gonna have to go c5 at some point to liberate that bishop, and that's gonna take time. And I actually go into the very thematic variation where white gets to take a pawn, but if that pawn is taken, black gets tremendous initiative and is completely winning. And that's what happened. And this is a variation. So his 2200 feet rated opponent blundered into a well-known pawn sacrifice. So bishop c4, knight f6, knight e5, e6, this is all theory. Uh, yeah, of course, you, you cannot take the queen because of bishop f7. Uh, so the queen moves to e2, b5, we want to go bishop b7 and c5 at some point, so bishop b3, queen c7, supporting the c6 pawn, castles, bishop d6, pressure on the knight, so d4, castles, c3, c5. Okay, this is the key variation, and in this position, if you turn on the engine, the engine says bishop f4 is best, rook e1 is second best, bishop g5 is the third best move, and I played against this once, actually, in the training game as white. Uh, for some reason, I played the two knights. And I played rook e1. We actually reached this position. I didn't know it. I saw that I couldn't take the pawn, so I played rook e1. And I wasn't happy with my position. If I had this today, I would go bishop f4. The engine says equal after bishop f4. His opponent took a free pawn, which is understandable. I mean, black's going to play c4 and bishop b7. So white takes. Okay, now why is this bad? It's bad because black has this killer move a5. And if you look at this queen, it doesn't have too many squares. Uh, in fact, what does the queen do? If if you play, let's say it's white to play and white plays queen c6, you can, you can just take. I think this is a great pawn sacrifice because, or sorry, rook sacrifice, because if, if you take the queen, I'm a piece up, if you take the rook, I take here, and then go bishop b7, and you resign. Okay. And the threat is, if it was black to play again, uh, then bishop a6. So the queen actually has to move. If the queen goes to a4, then the queen is on a4. You don't want your queen on a4. We're threatening to win a pawn, uh, so queen e2, the most sensible move. Okay, so cd4, cd4, bishop a6 anyway. And in this position, you basically have to play bishop c4. If you go knight d3, I can take on h2. If you go bishop c4, like happened in the game, then bishop takes c5. And if you take here, then I take on c4. If you take here with the queen, I take and take on c4. If you take on a6, like white did in the game, then black takes on h2. 
king h1 and just save the bishop bishop f4 uh, black is just better in this position the material is equal however the fact that there is no h pawn the fact that there may be rook d8 rook d5 rook h5 ideas maybe rook takes d4 uh, maybe the queen comes somewhere close and checks anywhere on the h file and then it's going to be checkmate the fact that the king is so unsafe makes this unplayable for white white played bishop d3 rook a d8 was played sensible bishop e3 defends the pawn uh rook d5 wants to go rook h5 with checkmate so rook a c1 uh if you play rook h5 now queen takes because the the black queen is hanging so queen b8 we need to wait rook c5 preventing rook h5 you can see that white is just on the back foot and defending and has nothing better to do but to defend and in this position uh rook c5 was played there was a better move uh gukesh could have taken on e3 and now uh rook d5 i think i think is forced uh rook takes d5 e takes d5 now if f takes e3 then h5 and you're gonna have a knight on g4 with checkmate that's unplayable you cannot do that you need to have your f pawn to cover g3 and if queen takes e3 then you just take on b2 and you're a pawn up in the end game with a safer king and pressure on d4 pressure on a2 game over so bishop e3 was better uh but rook c5 is is also fine dc5 bishop e3 and now again the same problem uh what do you take with f takes or or queen takes queen takes was better again i i feel just giving up the b2 pawn he took with the f pawn and now not h5 he didn't play h5 although he could have uh, he played queen b4 uh, which is also strong he wants to go queen h4 knight g4 uh, also fine e4 prevents that but now just queen takes pawn and the whole position is falling apart uh, e5 knight d7 the pawn is about to drop unless either queen e4 or rook e1 queen e4 played g6 again you have to play rook e1 but now rook c8 and all the pieces are coming in it's it's a pawn up end game with a safer king better major pieces and a better minor piece so no no discussion rook b8 queen e2 defends the pawn for the moment but queen d4 uh, and and that's it bishop b5 yeah bishop b5 doesn't do anything uh because it loses on the spot uh he probably had to play rook b1 which is too passive on bishop b5 you just take and take okay so after bishop b5 uh white actually resigned uh i thought this was very very instructive now uh remember this position if you play the two knights and don't take the b pawn because of a5 okay the next two games uh he's actually playing against good players and he's playing against two grandmasters the first game was played in the Beal uh, open uh, against alessio valsecchi who is at the time was 25 27 gukesh was 25 78 uh in Beal switzerland uh and yeah okay uh he played a completely new idea here against the fantasy which is why i chose this game to me this was incredibly exciting okay so we get the fantasy variation black plays e6 i play queen b6 or e6 i play both moves uh, i used to play e6 all the time and against knight c3 i would always play the same move i would go bishop b4 i would always go bishop b4 and bishop b4 is the best move but he played a sort of albin counter gambit in the fantasy karo khan he played the move c5 and when i saw this move I, I i wasn't using the engine when i was analyzing the game of course i was trying to figure out just how worse black is because it, it didn't make any sense to me now the idea is of course if you take on c5 which you are going to do white is uh, sorry black is gonna push d4 at some point probably probably if you take on c5 so we have a sort of albin counter gambit where this knight cannot go to f3 
So I, I, I couldn't really figure out why you would do this. I couldn't see a downside for white and I didn't understand it at all. Let's see what happens. Okay, so ED5, standard, probably a good idea. I would do that with white. ED5, and now white played a move I would never consider here. White played bishop b5, which confused me. Why would you want to go bishop b5? Bishop b5 allows knight c6. And after dc5, now we can just go bishop e6, and this pawn is very hard to defend. If you play something like bishop e3, I'm gonna go knight e7. That's actually what happened in the game. So for the moment, white is a pawn up, but black has incredible pieces because white has a pawn on f3, and it's very hard to develop. Instead, uh, what white should have done is simply dc5. Now, the only justification for this Albin type of pawn sacrifice is d4. After d4, you play bishop b5. And now, when knight c6 happens, you go queen e2. And on bishop e6, you go knight e4. This is the normal Albin stuff. This is very thematic. I, I don't know why white didn't do this. Maybe he was confused, but okay. Uh, instead of taking on c5, he played bishop b5. Knight c6 and now. But in this position, if d4, we are transposing. So we get back to why, why didn't black do this? I, again, I don't know. I think d4 was the best move. I, I don't see why bishop e6 should be played. d4 should have been played. Now let's go back. After bishop b5, if you wish to avoid that with black, if you wish to punish white for not taking on c5, then you don't go knight c6 because dc5 and d4 uh, could, could happen and white is going to be more pleasant. So I would go bishop d7 here. So we punish white for not taking on c5. And now what can white do? Uh, white doesn't want to take on d7, developing our piece. White doesn't want to take on c5 now because of bishop takes b5. And after knight takes b5, we just go queen a5, forcing the knight back to c3. And then we go knight e7. We're going to pick up this pawn. So after bishop d7, you don't want to take. So you go queen e2. Bishop e7. Okay, fine. If knight takes d5 here, then we can just go knight c6. For the moment, white is still a pawn down, maybe two pawns down if this is taken. Sorry, black is two pawns down. But after knight d4, there has to be compensation. Look at white's pieces. Look at white's king in the center. We're much closer to, to, to castle. And after, for example, bishop d7, queen d7, the knight is under pressure, the pawn is going to be under pressure. You have to probably play queen e4, but now we can take on c we can take on c2, take on d5. It gets extremely complicated, but that was the way to punish bishop b5. So I think white should have started dc5, against which d4 would have been played, and then bishop b5, knight c6. But since white started bishop b5 instead of dc, I don't understand why knight c6 was played. I think bishop d7 should have been played. Maybe this is too complicated, uh, and it is complicated, but if you're trying to understand these pawn sack lines, then it's all about peace activity and compensation for a pawn. I think bishop d7 was the way to go. Still, knight c6 played, dc5, and d4 not played. Instead, bishop e6, which is definitely inferior. d4 should have been played, followed by, of course, queen e2, bishop e6, knight e4, knight f6, bishop g5, and so on. So bishop e3 saves the pawn, knight e7, knight g2, knight f5. This was his idea. He probably wanted to keep the pawn on d5 to be able to threaten d4 at some point. So now you, you have to do something about the bishop, so bishop f2. Now in this position, white is much better. Uh, white is not only a pawn up, but black has zero compensation. In fact, white has a more active position. I think that the fact that this bishop 
was tucked away on f2 is good for white. It covers all the dark squared weaknesses. Okay, uh, Gukesh played queen g5, and queen g5 is a logical move. Uh, you want to castle queen side, you want to take the pawn on g2. So sensible. Now, if you had white here, what would you play? You can try and pause the video and d don't complicate things. Play simple chess. Okay. In this position, white played the weirdest move, a, a move I would never consider. White played queen d3. What does queen d3 do? Well, queen d3 defends the bishop. Okay, not that it needed defended, defending. It doesn't allow white to castle queenside. So th there's a queen on g5. It runs into a tempo, possibly, if the black king goes away from e8, runs into a tempo with knight e5 or knight b4. So another strange thing. It defends the e3 square, so preventing knight e3, which was scary. I agree with that. But if you're going to do that, uh, I mean, just allow knight e3. So let's say white plays a normal move. This is a normal move. g3 defends the pawn. And let's look at knight e3. Knight e3 we take, takes, and now we can go queen d3. Why wouldn't we go queen d3 now? Just evicting the queen. We're a pawn up, everything's safe. g3 was just the, the only move on the board. Uh, why would you do anything else? He played queen d3 and Gukesh of course took. So this game I chose because he was, in my mind, busted for playing knight c6 and playing this unsound c5 idea uh, but his opponent just gave it away easily so queen g2 and now an even worse move uh, i mean the bishop's still on f8 uh, the engine says rook f1 here i i don't know why uh, of course castling queen side you lose the bishop on f2, so you have to save. Uh, you have to save your rook. Uh, the engine says rook f1 is better for white. Rook g1 is winning for black, or close to winning. Uh, I think black still takes on h2, uh, but the bishop is defended, uh, so that must be the reason why rook f1 is better. Uh, in the positions we're going to see later in the game, this bishop was a problem piece. But for humans, it's understandable that you're trying to gain a tempo. I mean, the queen's going to take on h2 anyway, so you're not really gaining a tempo, you're just not defending your bishop. You're preventing your king from castling. Okay, uh, Gukesh took on h2. Now we have a position in which black is a pawn ahead. Why would black be a pawn up after sacrificing a pawn in move 4? Okay, knight d5. <clears throat> a pawn taken back, but rook d8. c4 you have to defend, bishop e7 finally developing, white cannot take the bishop, the queen is pinned. White cannot take on g7, the rook defends. Black wants to go bishop f6 at some point, so getting pretty scary. Now in this position, uh, probably queen e4 was the best move. This is the move I was looking at, because it threatens uh, to take on e7 and take on c6. Uh, everything is pinned all of a sudden. So if, if you, for example, bishop f6, play bishop f6, I take, 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 and, and I'm just running. Uh, this would have been hard to uh, to play for black at least, even though black is fine. Like you, you can just castle kingside here and, and you're fine. And for example, castles, bishop c6, bc6, knight e7, uh, you're gonna see, you're gonna see the pattern I'm talking about. So bc6, knight e7, knight e7. There is some pressure and maybe after knight g3 and queen e3 and castles queen side white can line up their pieces and try to survive. This is still better for black but I, I would say easier to play for white actually. Instead of that uh, Valseki played rook g4. Uh, I don't get rook g4. Uh, maybe he wanted to move the bishop Okay, uh, I don't know. I don't understand rook g4. Uh, rook is just castled. And in this position, uh, there is something you have to calculate 
as white, which white ended up miscalculating. So there's a loose bishop on f2 if you castle queenside. However, there's a mating threat because the rook is going to end up on d1. So basically, there's a threat to take everything, take on c6, take on e7, undefend the rook, and then take twice on d8. So, can you castle queenside? That's the question. That's what you have to calculate correctly here as white. If you want, you can pause the video. The pattern is a double attack on d8 with these two captures. Is that enough for white? Figure it out. Okay, so white did end up castling and, and losing the game. Uh, the correct move was bishop takes, b takes, knight e7, knight e7, and of course now you don't have a rook on d1, but you can go rook d4. And this is, again, better for black, but relatively close to, to a playable position. The engine gives it as minus 2 for black, but at least you have some activity. At least you have some activity. Instead, castle's queen side uh, just just doesn't work. Uh, queen f2 played, of course. You take you take the bishop, uh, and now bishop c6. And in this position, uh, I think bc6 was just correct. I'm going to show you why. If bc6, uh, knight e7, knight e7. Queen d8, you, you don't take and get mated. Of course, you can go knight g6. And playable, relatively playable. But uh, instead of that, there's just a great move that wins immediately. This is what white had missed. Uh, in the game, Gukesh didn't find it. He didn't play bc either. Uh, he took on c5, which is strange uh, because it doesn't do anything about the threats other than defend the bishop with the knight so if knight e7 here we just take with the queen so our rook is defended but you can do the same thing you can defend against this mate threat with tempo and if you can do something with tempo then that's much better so the key move here was h5 i will say this is very easy to miss but it's a forcing move that solves your back rank issues, so it's not that hard to spot. I think for Gukesh, who was 2600 at the time of this game, I think he should have seen this. Now h5 uh, just forces the rook to move, and, and it gives the king loof. So now all the variations work. And now if rook f4, for example, now we play bc6. And knight e7 isn't a threat anymore. Knight e7, knight e7. If queen d8, we just take rook d8, rook d8, king h7, and that's it. This is queen for, for two rooks. We basically have an extra piece. Okay, so after bishop takes c6, that's the reason castling queenside was a blunder. So white shouldn't have castled queenside because it loses a piece to queen f2, and after bishop c6, h5 just ends up being a piece up for black. Unfortunately for Gukesh, he played queen c5, still okay, still okay, but not as simple. White played bishop b7, saves the bishop, fine. h5 now, he should have played it a move ago, okay. Rook e4, and now bishop g5, uh, finally getting the bishop out of this attack. But now if you count the material, it's actually level. Black has superior peace activity and a safer king, although even that's ar arguable, uh, and black should be better, but a dynamic position like this means that any mistakes could lead to equality, or even a better position for your opponent. f4 played, uh, bishop takes d5, uh, a trade, bishop takes d5 and bishop f6. Now this bishop is a very strong piece. This knight is a very strong piece. White's rooks are definitely disconnected, that's obvious, but they're disconnected in a pretty bad way. Uh, unless you play knight c3, I don't see those rooks working together. I would say white's only good piece is the bishop for the moment, but it's pinned to the queen. Okay, knight c3 makes sense, keeps everything sort of solid. Okay. 
97 exploiting this pin okay and maybe the knight is going to jump into b4 maybe into d4 later on queen e2 played attacks the knight uh g6 the knight is defended twice so that was okay king b1 uh, i don't uh, see a reason for this in fact king b1 may be just a waste of tempo because if a rook lands on the b file your knight is just going to be loose and your knight seems perfectly placed so rook b8 just punishing king b1 and now how do you defend uh, you can go b3 actually uh, because the knight isn't defended uh, so you can give up your knight and try to trade but if b3 then bishop takes c3 uh, and rook takes e7 seems very loose it seems like the dark squares are too weak however black's light squares are weak as well so if for example something like this of course we cannot go queen g2 straight away threatening queen g6 because uh, rook b3 is is a threat in in many positions but it's double-edged definitely the black king could be in trouble too but b3 i think was the way to go instead white played rook e5 and what's even funnier gukesh didn't take it i mean it defends the knight it it trades off this bishop which is the key defender of your dark squares but you should take bishop e5 f5 i feel is completely fine uh this should just be winning we go knight f5 I don't know where the knight goes, probably knight e4 exploiting the f6 square, but now we can start offering trades, queen e3, white has to decline, we're just an exchange up, b2 is obviously weak, I would have taken that rook, but Gukish plays queen c7, uh, which is also okay, the threat was of course bishop takes f7 winning the queen, uh, rook e3, save the rook, now the rook can defend the knight, that, that's fine, knight f5 the knight drops back the rook has to stay on the third rank otherwise bishop takes c3 now you can see why king b1 was was a weakness rook e d3 rook b6 just wants to double put pressure on b2 queen e4 uh, if the knight moves queen g6 you have to pay attention to this pen so this is happening also prevents even more queen b7 rook b8 so queen b8 played okay and now b3 uh, pause the video here and answer the question can white take on b3 is the sacrifice good enough is it winning okay uh, it is it's it's completely sound and completely winning this bishop and the b file are over overwhelming knight uh, rook takes a takes queen takes king c1 forced if king a1 then we play bishop c3 we check now bishop c3 anyway rook to d2 rook to b8 threatening mate in one with queen b8 uh so bishop f7 which just delays things for a while gokesh played king g7 which is a human move he could have taken the bishop there aren't enough checks after king f7 rook d7 king f8 that's it those are the checks unless you trade rooks and now when you trade rooks i don't take it i just go king g7 and if you want to repeat, my king is going to end up on h6, perfectly safe. And if you take on b8, I'm just going to take on d2 and knight and pawn up. Thank you. Okay, but he played king g7, which is also completely winning. Uh, rook d7 uh, saves against the mate threat and prepares a bishop discovery, but it's too late. Queen a3, king d1, queen a1. The king only has, well, one sensible square. Uh, knight g3 check wins the queen king f3 knight e4 that's that's it uh, the game ended rook d1 queen takes d1 and knight d2 check and in this position balseki resigned uh, this is the only bad game by gukesh i would say uh, out of the opening i think uh, this is the key mistake not playing bishop d7 here i believe white could have been overwhelmingly better in this one okay last game uh this was played in the the rapid part of the aim chess meltwater champions so played online uh 
this game features something interesting. Uh, Gukish was playing Eric Hansen uh, in something that I'm not too familiar with. This is a line in the prayer uh, where White offers this uh, descent game. This end game is known to be better for White if takes, 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 takes. So what I do here is I play g6 and White goes e5 and it's a closed position where I like black. <coughs> but uh, Gukish played the move bishop g4. Uh, bishop g4 is the third most common uh, and it's not something I'm familiar with. After h3, uh, you can take on f3 and go bishop h5, very similar to the two knights. Uh, if you take, uh, then queen takes and the knight ends up on c3 and you basically get the two knights uh, variation. Okay, uh, he took, queen takes, e6, and now uh, the improvement compared to the standard two knights is that white doesn't have to go knight c3. If white goes knight c3, this is the standard two knights. We are transposing into a position with a million games. White uh, is going to go g3 and bishop g2, and black is going to go knight f6, knight b7, bishop b4, and so on. However, the knight doesn't have to go to c3. White can play g3 straight away. And this was interesting. Knight f6. Now you should remember that e5 is never a good move. e5 leads to a perfect French for black because after e5, knight d7, black is going to go c5, knight c6, bishop e7, and you have the French without the bishop on c8. This bishop on, on g2 is going to do nothing, and the e pawn is weak. So if, for example, d4, then c5, and I don't know, you're probably gonna end up taking. This is just dreadful for white. So knight f6 isn't really a provocation. e5 is never good. Bishop g2, bishop e7. Uh, still delaying knight d7 because you want this square for the knight. If you get carried away and go knight d7, then maybe e5 is good because your knight has to go back to g8. Okay, castles, castles. Rook e1. And now a5. And a5 is common in many two knights positions, but... We still have to bear in mind that, that this knight could end up on d2, which makes this kind of resemble a king's Indian position, uh, but, but there's no knight on f3. So this is very close to a king's Indian attack, but it's way more flexible. And it's not clear to me what black should be doing. So if I had black here, I'd be struggling to find a plan. I don't want to move my knight unless I can move it away to a6 because I don't want to take away the d7 square from my f6 knight. I don't want to play knight a6 before I play a5, so a5 makes sense. But even if I do get my knight to a6, I get control over c5, so let's imagine, uh, over b4, sorry, so let's imagine a5, knight a6, knight b4, but c3 and a3 can always be played. So I wouldn't really be sure about this plan. Let's see his plan. So. This position, this game, was better for Eric Hansen for a long time, which proves that uh, Gukesh was struggling to find a good plan. Still, he kept doing active things, ended up equalizing, and then turning the game over in his favor by playing for the most thematic of the Karakan advantages, the endgame. He kept gaining space until he got a better endgame. In the end, Hansen made a mistake, you're going to see, but, but what he did was really nice. So a5, okay, queen e2, makes sense, maybe you want to go f4, maybe you want to go h4, maybe you need to defend the light squares. Knight a6, knight d2, a4. Now this is the first strange part to me, uh, I did not expect a4, uh, I'd expected some pressure on c2. So... Knight b4 sort of justifies queen e2 because it defends uh, c2 in advance and the knight just drops to f1 or f3 and the pawns defend it, so it's pretty useless to play knight b4 here. But I still didn't believe, I still, still didn't expect a4. Okay, a3, now we finally have to stop what, what he's doing. If white doesn't go f a3 now, then black goes a3, and this is pretty good for black. Everyone can see that. So a3. Knight goes to c5, and now we can see a similarity to the Tartakower game where he played h5, h4, h3, 
was prevented by h3 and black had a pawn on h4 white has had pawns over here do you see the similarity it's the same idea it's just on the other side of the board so he's playing for the same sort of endgame advantage a long-term blockade of the pawn chain but on the other side of the board and his king is is not stuck at the end of it in the previous position his king was on g8 it's on g8 now but the expansion is happening on the queen side okay finally e5 now that this knight has developed now that c5 has been prevented by black's own knight maybe this is safer uh, and knight f3 was played now in this position i believe that f4 has to be played if not f4 then d4 uh, i think this is where hansen could have gained an edge uh, f4 seems extremely natural uh, i don't know why you would go knight f3 uh, the only reason is if g6 blocks everything up successfully, which I doubt, or if f5 is a good move, which again, I'm not really sure. We don't take, we just go knight f3. And it seems like white has tremendous control over the king side and the d4 square and e6 is weak. But okay, uh, after knight f7 he played knight f3. And this at least means that if white is to start... Uh, if white was to start an expansion on the king side, it would take way more time. So as a Karakhan player, you have to be feeling good here, because there's no attack coming. And Gukesh continues, b5. Okay, uh, so what does he want to do? Uh, I wasn't really sure what he was doing. Again, I, I was analyzing all of these games at first without the engine, and I was playing basically solitaire chess, trying to guess... Uh, Gukesh's next moves. Hansen played h4, uh, rook e8 played, knight g5. Okay, an attack could be starting if black isn't careful, then watch out for these two squares. So h6 has to be played. Knight h3 played, freeing up the f pawn, maybe the f pawn moves, maybe the d pawn moves. Bishop f8, guarding all of these, guarding e6. The knight came to f4. And the knight came back to a6, d4, and c5. So this was the idea. He wants to open up the c file. He wants to put pressure on c2. Now we know that if c3 is ever played, same as in the Tartic our position, with this pawn on a4, in the other game the pawn was on h4, in this case b3 becomes a huge weakness. Now that means that c5 is an, is an excellent move. c3 was played, and after cd4, cd4, now we have a lot to work with. Now, if we can imagine something like this in the future, or this, that seems to be a great endgame for black. And the reason I chose this game is because I sometimes struggle to, to find ideas like these. I sometimes think that advancing the pawns on the queen side would be a huge waste of time and I, I couldn't see a benefit to this. But when you put it this way, this just seems like a great endgame. If we traded off all the pieces but the rooks and one knight, I think black is just easily winning. Okay, uh, instead of doing that, again, uh, proving my misconceptions, he doesn't go for this slow maneuvering game. If, if I had black, I would go something like queen b6 and then go rook c8, rook b8. He plays b4. If we turned on the engine, the engine says queen b6 is good. White is about plus 1.3. Uh, knight a b8 is fine, although I, I don't understand that at all. Uh, and b4 is the best move. Queen b6 is fine, maybe you can get away with that, but b4 is, is better. This is, again, the position is still better for white, but b4 fights for equality. Uh, Hansen played queen g4, fine, uh, threatening to move the knight, take, although I don't understand why he'd played uh, knight f4, he could have played queen g4 without that. b8, 3, you have to take with the pawn, okay, now we still have access to the b3 square, but under more favorable circumstances, I would say. Now, this is still a possibility. 
the engine wanted to play knight 8b8 on the previous move. So this is still a possibility, one of these two squares. It's even stronger. Finally, knight 8b8. Knight h3 threatening to take on h6, so king h8. Queen h5 threatening to take on f7, so g6. All of this was forced. Queen f3 threatening to take on f7, so queen e7. Okay, h5, breaking the position down. And as a Karo Khan player, I've been in a situation like this many times. My opponent is trying to checkmate me, and I'm playing for one square on the queen side. In this case, two squares, fine. But it, this is not a good feeling. However, he kept everything under control. g5, queen c3, f5. And when I saw f5, I was shocked. Uh, the engine says knight b6 is the way to equality. You just plant the knight on c4 if you can, uh, and then go on from there. But f5 is fine. And I was afraid of ef6. Because after knight f6, uh, taking this pawn, it, it doesn't seem like I can take that pawn. But okay, apparently the king is perfectly safe. This bishop is coming to g7, there's pressure on d4, so the pawn cannot be taken. I would be terrified of playing f5 and allowing this trade, but apparently it just loses a bunch of material for white. It would be hard for me to even consider a move like f5. Again, this is why we are learning from Gukesh. Uh, rook b1. Rook a7, not something I would consider again, but it does prevent rook c7. Uh, I would consider something like knight b6 instead. Uh, well, sorry, preventing rook b7. Uh, bishop f1. Queen d8. Bishop d2. Rook c7. Okay, queen d3, knight c6. Finally, finally, we're getting closer uh, to occupying these squares. This also prevents bishop uh, a5. Rook b5. Queen e7, we're on the a3 pawn. So rook a1 has to defend, rook e c8. And now we can see the makings of a great endgame. Now that our king has been secured, it, there doesn't seem to be too much sense to these pawn advances and these especially this knight on the king side and once our rooks start moving we're just going to be better bishop e3 unfortunate but frees up your queen rook a7 rook b4 attacks the pawn uh, queen e8 you cannot take because of knight c5 double attacking your queen uh, and your rook or knight d4 uh, so if rook a4, knight, uh, sorry, not knight e4, knight e5, uh, queen d1, attacks the pawn again, and now bishop b4. I mean, probably because it was a rapid game, this was just a blunder. Uh, he had to move the rook somewhere. I don't know where the engine moves the rook. The engine says rook b2. Uh, black has completely equalized. Maybe black even has a slight edge. Queen e8 was a sneaky move. Uh, preventing rook a4 and threatening bishop b4 queen d1 and, and that's it but even if Hansen doesn't blunder even if something like rook b2 we still have to like black's position I mean we have rook c3 coming we're just gonna pick this pawn up okay I'll show you how the game ended so rook, uh, queen d1, bishop b4, a b, knight b6 finally, finally we have the square bishop a6, rook a8 and this position, if the knight lands on c4, if we have a passed a pawn, is just too much. Hansen tried to complicate, but it didn't work. It actually worked in black's favor. And in this position, he resigned. There's no defense uh, to either rook c1 or, or queen h3 or queen f3 or e2 there are too many threats you can even just take on f4 and just push the pawns on f5 okay i hope you liked the games i hope you got something from this uh, it took me a while to analyze the five games because i did without an engine i checked my analysis later some of it was right some of it wasn't uh, for all of you e4 players and karakan players i hope you are stronger after this video uh, thank you very much for watching stay tuned for more chess bye bye